everyone! Today we are going to be talking about the legend of Paganini selling his soul to the devil. Although the legend itself is very well known, it's less clear how it originated and how it became so widespread throughout his lifetime. The most obvious reason is that people couldn't explain how Paganini got to be so good on the violin, so they said that there had to be some kind of supernatural force helping him. However, there were actually a number of factors beyond this which is what we will be exploring today. Content warning for mentions of physical abuse and sexual violence, but there will not be anything particularly graphic or explicit. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy, and here is Debunking the Legends of Paganini. So to understand the origins of the legend, it's important to note that Paganini wasn't always associated with the devil. In his earlier concerts in the 1800s and 1810s, his virtuosic violin playing did garner a lot of attention. He executed difficult techniques with such ease that people couldn't comprehend what they were seeing and hearing. His crossing the line from the comprehensible to the incomprehensible changed his image from that of a regular mortal violinist to that of a mystical immortal being. However, this association with the supernatural was still relatively positive. People often called him a magician or wizard, waving his magic magic wand slash bow. By the mid-1810s, however, Paganini was increasingly associated with the evil side of the supernatural, with audiences giving him nicknames like Demon, Devil, and Satan. One of the reasons for this shift was that in 1813, he published a piece called Le Strege, commonly known as the Witch's Dance, which takes its melody from a popular opera that depicted several witches. If you listen to the Piece, the music itself is actually pretty light. It avoids the typical evil tropes that other composers commonly used, like tritones and diminished seventh chords. However, the title of Witches was enough to stir people's imaginations and associate Paganini with witchcraft. Another ingredient in creating this legend was the rumors of Paganini's criminal past, which began to gain popularity in the mid-1810s. These rumors were based in some truth. Paganini was notorious for his womanizing and for viewing women as sexual objects that he could pursue. In 1815, he had accidentally gotten a woman pregnant, then forced her to take a potion that would cause a stillbirth, and was jailed for several days on charges of rape and abduction. However, people said that his skills on the violin came from having spent eight years in jail and having nothing to do besides practice. Another common belief was was that the strings on his violin were made of the intestines of the women he had murdered. However, Paganini had actually managed to hide his time in jail from the public, so most of these rumors came from stories of other musician criminals, which the audience then projected onto Paganini. The association of Paganini with the devil became extremely widespread by the 1820s, when Paganini began touring and playing concerts throughout much of Europe and reached unprecedented levels of fame and wealth. He was basically treated like a modern-day rock star. People would mob his hotel and follow him from city to city. His portrait was hung in shop windows up and down the streets, and there were even foods and fancy clothes named after him. Yes, there were people who resented him or envied him for his skill, but they were a small minority compared to the adoring crowd. With his newfound fame, however, the negative rumors surrounding him also began to circulate much more widely, and thus the legend of Paganini being associated with the devil was firmly established. I should clarify that the legend actually has several different variations. The most widely believed version was that Paganini had sold his soul to the devil in exchange for his skills on the violin. Two was that Paganini was possessed by the 
the devil, which was more of a minority opinion that was mostly held amongst devout Catholics. And three was that Paganini simply was the devil in human form. The fact that there were different variations of the legend is actually quite important, and we'll see later how they sort of evolved out of one another and sometimes merged together in a rather convoluted gray area. So now that we have a rough outline of how the legend originated, we can take a closer look at Paganini's life and music to try and debunk the myths surrounding him. If you'll remember, Paganini was originally associated with the supernatural largely because of his technical abilities on the violin. People couldn't find a logical explanation for how he played things that they believed to be impossible or how he could make it look so easy, so they decided that he was being helped by supernatural forces. I should clarify here that Paganini was not just a technical virtuoso with no musicality, as people often described his performances as having great emotional depth, but much of his demonic reputation came from the technical aspects of his playing. And this technical proficiency can be explained by several non-supernatural factors. He was very naturally talented, but in order to harness that talent, he had to work extremely hard. As a kid, his father had recognized his talent and realized that it could bring him a lot of money, and so he pushed Paganini to practice very long hours, with Paganini claiming later in life that he was often deprived of food and also physically beaten as punishment for making a mistake or for not practicing enough. However, Paganini himself was also very driven, and as an independent artist free from his father's control, he continued to practice and perfect his technique. It's interesting to note that when Paganini first wrote his set of 24 caprices, they were too difficult for him to play, and it had taken him many hours of work before he had been able to play his own pieces. Paganini's technical ability was also aided by his flexible wrist and fingers, possibly caused by a genetic condition like Marfan syndrome, which would cause extreme flexibility in the joints. And finally, his technical ability was in part due to an older style of playing that is largely forgotten today. Most violinists today play with a chin rest and a shoulder rest, meaning they can hold the violin with their chin without having to support it with their left hand. Paganini, however, played without a chin rest or a shoulder rest, as they were both invented well after he had already learned and gotten used to his style of playing. What this means is that he couldn't hold the violin in place with his chin and actually had to hold it up with his left hand. As a result, his left hand generally stayed in place around the middle of the fingerboard, which is where you press down the strings to create the different pitches. Instead of shifting up and down the fingerboard to reach different notes, as most violinists do today, Paganini could simply tilt his hand back and forth and stretch his fingers to reach all the notes that he needed. The style of playing is much more efficient because it doesn't require as much back and forth movement of the entire arm. Especially with his flexible wrist and fingers, Paganini could make very good use of this technique, and when combined with his natural talent and years of hard work, he could reach a level of technical proficiency that very people had before him. However, Paganini's virtuosic skill was not the only reason that people associated him with the devil. If you'll remember, much of the reason that people started to connect him with evil supernatural beings instead of just benevolent ones was due to the rumors of his criminal past. This was reinforced by his visually violent style of playing. Paganini would often strike the violin with the bow for dramatic visual effect. Many of his contemporaries described it as lashing the violin and making it cry out in pain. What made Paganini's performances seem so evil, then, was not the music itself, but the visual aspect of appearing to inflict violence on his violin. And at the time, musical journalism, such as concert reviews in newspapers, tended to conflate the performance with the performer. That is, Paganini's seemingly evil treatment of the violin 
violin was extended to his personality. People began to believe that it wasn't just Paganini's playing that was demonic, Paganini himself was also demonic, which marks the line between selling your soul to the devil or being possessed by the devil and actually being a manifestation of the devil. And remember that all three of those variations were believed at the time. Adding to this image of a violent abuser was the popular notion of gendering the violin, meaning that people often saw the instrument itself as a woman, partly because of its shape and also its higher sound representing a feminine voice. This comparison was made quite often in 19th century literature, art, and musical reviews, sometimes very crudely, and to Paganini's audiences, his brutality towards the violin was seen as an extension of his heavily publicized womanizing and rumors of sexual violence. In addition to this, Paganini's career actually coincided with a number of cultural movements that helped to fuel his demonic reputation. One of the most popular literary genres of the time was the gothic novel, which often had themes of horror and violence, perfectly aligning with Paganini's violent style of playing and rumors of crime. Paganini also looked uncannily similar to the protagonists of those stories, the Byronic hero, in that he had an extremely pale complexion, sunken cheeks, and an unnerving smile, and there was the fact that he often dressed all in black. His cadaverous appearance also made people think that he was possessed, because in order for someone to be possessed, they had to be already dead. Paganini's appearance can be more reasonably explained by the fact that he was chronically ill throughout much of his life. An interesting story is that as a kid, he had contracted a case of measles so severe that people took him for dead and nearly buried him alive. Another piece of culture that contributed to these legends was the story of Faust, an ancient legend that was made popular in the early 1800s by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's play Faust. In the story, the protagonist Faust sells his soul to the devil Mephistopheles in exchange for infinite knowledge. As you can imagine, it was very easy for audiences to draw a parallel between Faust and Paganini by saying that Paganini had sold his soul in order to acquire his skills on the violin. Not only that, but Paganini's sense of wild showmanship also aligned with the visually elaborate productions of Faust, what with onstage dancing demons and such. We can see Paganini's association with Faust in the nicknames that his audiences gave him. People called him both Dr. Faustus and Mephistopheles, which is interesting because Dr. Faustus, or Faust, is the person who sold his soul to the devil, and Mephistopheles is the actual devil. Thus, Paganini was viewed both as a regular person who sold his soul to the forces of evil, and as the forces of evil itself, with this second interpretation becoming more common over time. And finally, another story that was very popular at the time was Tartini's Dream, in which, allegedly, the composer Giuseppe Tartini had dreamed that he had made a pact with the devil, who had then played a piece so beautiful that Tartini literally had his breath taken away and woke up from the lack of oxygen. He then attempted to write down the piece that the devil had played, which eventually became the Devil's Trill Sonata. The story was widely circulated in the 1800s, and performances of the Devil's Trill Sonata became more frequent, just as Paganini was becoming more famous in Europe. After his Paris debut in 18 a critic wrote that the devil from Tartini's dream had to be Paganini, which is basically saying that Paganini actually was the devil himself and is a step further from Paganini simply selling his soul to the devil. What is interesting to note is that there's actually quite a long history of musical virtuosos being associated with the devil, beginning as early as the Middle Ages, and Paganini was definitely not the first. However, the legend surrounding
painting Paganini in particular became much more famous largely because of the unique timing of his lifetime and career, in that his rise to fame coincided with all of these movements in popular culture. From watching Faust, reading gothic novels, and hearing about Tartini's dream, audiences were already prepared to see someone like Paganini, and when he did appear on stage, he fit those pre-existing notions to an uncanny degree. The public had certain expectations of what a protagonist should look like, and Paganini was the physical manifestation of those expectations. And finally, one other factor that contributed to Paganini's demonic public image was his relentless greed for money. On his concert tours throughout Europe, he made a profit that was unprecedented for musicians of the time. He did this by finding out what people normally would pay for a concert ticket, and then doubling and even tripling that price. He was often accused of robbing the people. Yes, they had the choice to not buy the tickets, but Paganini also had the choice of lowering the prices, as he managed many of his own concert logistics. Even when he had way more money than he needed to live comfortably, he kept his ticket prices high and kept most of the profit for himself. He did occasionally have benefit concerts, where he would donate the money to charity, however, he did this much less often than other virtuosos at the time. For example, the pianist Franz Liszt, who was known for his, quote, humanitarian streak, and so by comparison, Paganini seemed that much more evil. So now that we've discussed how and why the legends of Paganini originated, and how they became as famous as they are, there is still one more piece of the puzzle that I think we should talk about, and that is how did Paganini feel about these legends? On the surface, they certainly garnered him a lot of publicity and increased his ticket sales. However, it's important to remember that Paganini did not start these legends himself. Instead, they arose out of the audience, including other musicians and music critics, as a result of the factors that we discussed. Paganini himself said that he believed his abilities had been gifted to him by a guardian angel. This belief probably originated in his childhood when his mother had told him that she had had a dream in which an angel had promised her that Paganini would become a great violinist. And as an adult in private, Paganini actually viewed the demonic legends rather negatively, because apart from selling tickets, these legends actually had a very negative impact on Paganini himself, which I don't think is talked about enough. Paganini was treated as a celebrity, except it was both as a supernatural entity that stood above regular mortals, and as something far less than human. People thought he had no soul, or was a corpse possessed by an evil spirit. They would do some really weird things, like look at his feet to see if he had hooves like the devil. People would go up to him and touch him just to see if he was real. He was something of a curiosity, a spectacle for people's own entertainment. Paganini said that he believed his audiences wanted to squeeze every last drop out of him for their own benefit, as much as he squeezed every last drop out of them for his own profit. As he was treated less and less like a regular person, his personality began to change. He began to shrink into himself and became much more reclusive. It doesn't help that, as a kid, he had been forced to spend basically all his time practicing instead of playing outside with other kids. Throughout much of his life, he lacked that crucial sense of connection with other human beings. And that is why I think the legend of Paganini is in some ways a tragedy. I don't mean to paint him solely as a victim, as he did do a lot of terrible things, like with his relentless pursuit of money and in the way that he treated women, but what is often forgotten in favor of his demonic public image is the fact that he was a regular human being, capable of both evil, good, and everything in between. If you'll remember, he did hold charity concerts for the poor, as they reminded him of his own upbringing. He also cared deeply for his son Achille, and tried to make sure that Achille would have the childhood that he himself never did. Today, however, we mostly tend to remember Paganini as the devil's violinist, or the devil himself. Our memory of Paganini is actually the memory of the legends of Paganini, and we forget that he was actually a real person. In a way, the legends of Paganini were true. 
true. He didn't sell his soul for his abilities on the violin, but in pursuing the level of artistic achievement and subsequent recognition that he did, he set himself apart from the rest of humanity and lost something even more important, his place amongst other people. And so that is debunking the legends of Paganini. I hope you learned a little bit more about how the legends came to be and the various cultural factors that played into them. I also hope that in the process I've been able to make Paganini himself seem a little bit more human and bring him down to earth or up to earth if you prefer. And other than that, I think that is about it for this video. Thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. Thank you for being here and I will see you all next time. Bye.